Peace, grace, and mercy be multiplied to you from God our Father, from our loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As you listen to this text in last week's test, it was like being in a Sunday school with children once again, wasn't it? You heard all these names and all the great things that they had done. Cain, Noah, Enoch, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Rahab, Joseph, and all the others. Remember going through that in Sunday school many, many years ago, perhaps? Good people, outstanding saints of the Old Testament, people whose faith was well known to the recipients of this letter, and when the writer sent these things, he said, hey, we're not the first ones to ever encounter difficulties. We're not the first ones to ever encounter any problems. Look at these people who went ahead of us, and what did they get for reward? They had a promise which yet to be given. They didn't get to see the end of it, but they believed and they walk by faith and not by sight. Now the Bible says all scripture is written by the inspiration of God and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for correction. Therefore, this is all profitable for you and for me. You and I are also surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We know from our Sunday school time about all these faithful people we believe by faith they made it, we can too. But then, being New Testament people, not like the people in our text here, what do we have to add to that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Paul, Peter, James, Jude, Timothy, Titus, and all these other famous people of the, Old, of the New Testament. These were the people that continued the movement by the power of the Holy Spirit so that others would grab onto the Christian faith and walk by sight. The Bible is closed with the book of Revelation. But your Bible and my Bible, our personal Bible, in a very small way continues. Because we have another cloud of witnesses, a multitude of saints, and who are they? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> You're going to tell me. Well, then we're not going to know. <laughs> let, me, let me prime the pump by saying, I have a cloud of witnesses that you don't know anything about. And you have a cloud of witnesses that I don't know anything about. First, let's think of the things that probably I learned, and you may not, at the seminary. I learned about many clerks and kings who perpetuated the faith. I don't know if the name St. Francis or St. Ambrose or St. Augustine means anything to you. Maybe it does. Kaiser uh, Constantine, what is the English word? Caesar. All these people were the cloud of witnesses that continued the church before the Reformation. Then the Reformation, all those great names, including one especially, Martin, Martin, Martin Luther. In our own Missouri Senate, we have this hero of the faith. Think about these people. They had to leave if they wanted freedom of religion, if they didn't want the Presbyterian faith forced on them and they could no longer be Lutherans, they had to leave. They had to leave house and home, family and friends, culture and language. Who's the foremost name among those people? C.F.W. Walter. Now, within that cloud that I know of, and you don't, and you know of that I don't. Who are these people? Those are those individual people in your life and in mine that brought the Christian faith to us, that strengthened us in the faith, and encouraged us to walk the straight and narrow because that's what they were doing. I can start with my Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Waring, when I was a preteen, pre-teenager, I still think of things, where I can remember some of her illustrations way back then. What am I give you now? She said, Billy had two dimes to go to church. This is a long time ago. One was for the church, one was for an ice cream cone. And he flipped it and caught it and flipped it and caught it and flipped it and fell down and went in the gutter and then into the, uh, trap, the thing down there, you can't get out of it. <laughs> There's the Lord's dime. <laughs> he still had his for ice cream. I remember things like that. Well, my home church, my brother, 
especially our pastor. My sister, who was of another denomination, but nevertheless a saint and somebody who encouraged me in my faith. My dad, though he was long gone when I was around, that is to say he died when I was two, his faith lived on through our family, through his friends, and through our neighbors. And I know about those things. My mother also. The seminary experience, my fellow classmates, some of them were a lot stronger Christians than I was, and the professors, some of them, not all of them, some of them were a pain, but <laughs> some of them were really good too. Fellow pastors and other lay people of other denominations have encouraged me in my faith. And then there's the congregations. People in every congregation, including this one, people that I could say, they were in a sense my pastor. They built me up. They kept me straight and narrow. Now, Jay doesn't believe that happened, but it did. <laughs> They were my strength. They're the cloud of witnesses, and most of them are gone now. But they're up there cheering me on. Now, as I said these things, some of you were thinking, well, I got my story too. Who were some of the saints that are in that cloud around you? Uh, Rod, I'm going to pick on you. Uh, my mother. Your mother. Sunday school teachers. Sunday school teacher. Gary. My sister, um, my older sister, um, and uh, the first pastor I had as a Lutheran, and of course my wife. <laughs> Jay? Frankie McFerrin, my first Sunday school teacher and youth group leader, and of course my wife. Uh-huh. Now I'm not going to call it anybody that didn't, didn't prompt, but if you want to say something, I'll listen. <laughs> Anybody? All right. These are the people that were that God used through the Holy Spirit to build us up. Where would we be if it wasn't for them? Well, I, I, I think about some of those people, and, and I have to say, yes, faith cometh by hearing, but it comes pretty good when people speaking right to you that word and letting their faith spill over on you. Now, therefore, since we are surrounded by these crowds of witnesses, what does the rest of the text say? Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings to us and run the race that is set before us. What are those weights? Think of a runner. Think of the Olympics. There's America's number one runner, a woman, and she's dressed in pantyhose. No. You lay aside all the necklaces and the earrings and the jewelry, and you get right down to the bare minimum so that you can run. Let us run aside, let aside every weight. Barbells are for weightlifting. They're not for anything else. That's physically speaking, spiritually speaking, what are we talking about? Well, lay aside superstition, we don't need that. We don't need fear and anxiety. We don't need to borrow anything from another religion. We don't need any man-made rules and regulations. We don't need hatred and grudges. If we're going to run the race of life with Jesus Christ, lay aside all these weights. And then it says, and sin. Well, what's the sin? I don't think of the Ten Commandments. I think what this holy writer is saying to each and every individual, it's the thing that is your pet sin. It's the thing that you have that propensity for. Now, for some people, it's alcoholism. So for other people, hey, I can drink a beer or a glass of wine. It doesn't bother me at all. So that's not our problem, but it is the other person's problem. For some, it's gossiping, gluttony, egotism, foul language, selfishness, and the list goes on. In every case, whatever it is, whatever your propensity is, we are called to deny that problem and take up that particular cross and run with Jesus. It says here, run the race of, with your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He ran his. He set his face toward Jerusalem for the last time, and what was that implying? that he was going there to suffer and die for our sins. 
So much was the setting of the face. What does it say in the Garden of Gethsemane? He sweated blood. What can we compare this to? He said he did it for the joy that was set before him. Can you understand that? The cross, he ran the race because of the joy that was set before him. Well, Jesus gave us a clue. He said, consider a woman in childbirth. She has a lot of pain, but the joy returns as soon as she holds that baby in her arms. It's gone now. And so his joy was knowing that he was defeating death and winning for us our salvation. God loves us, Jesus loves us, and he knew the joy as he looked ahead into the future, and he saw you and I coming to faith and being saved. Now, we're to look at him, the author and perfecter of our faith. He is running our race with us and for us. He's giving us the strength to do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What song do you know of that's not in our hymn that talks about looking at the face of Jesus? Gary, you're an old Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, accent on the old. Uh, I, I, I Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The things of earth, trials, temptations, sorrow, grief, disappointments, betrayals, loneliness, you name it. They're now vapor as they fade away because Jesus is so much more important. Now, what else? That cloud of witnesses, those dear people, especially your grandparents, parents, siblings, aunts and uncles, cousins, Maybe a Sunday school teacher, maybe a public school teacher. They're in heaven. You want to see them again? Yeah. How about this song? God be with you till we meet again. Isn't that something to say to those who are going? When life's perils thick confound you, put his arms unfailing around you. God be with you till we meet again. This was a parting hymn from my Texas church. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet, till we meet, till we meet. God be with you till we meet again. And what more can we say then? Amen. 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 I didn't hear you. Amen. Amen. Let the